Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's session, and I hope all of you have a great week in Detroit and KubeCon. And today, we will talk a little bit on SIG scheduling. Uh, so it's a maintenance session, so I hope this session is more interactive, and uh, we can leave enough time for you to ask questions. And basically, this is a session that we will talk more on the latest update of the SIG. So today we were supposed to have four speakers here, but Ching Chan from Alibaba and Kente from Dark Cloud can now attend in person. So here is just me, Wei from Apple, and uh, Kente from Merkari. Yeah, we will cover the topic. All right, here's uh, today's agenda. As usual, we will give a very short introduction on the scheduler itself, and then give uh, some details on recent, recent developer updates on the last two or three releases. And then uh, as a SIG, we sponsored some sub-projects that related with the scheduling. So we will also give some updates on the sub-projects as well. And lastly, we will uh, <coughs> have the Q&A. All right, the first thing, uh, what is scheduler anyways? So schedulers, as a core component of Kubernetes, uh, just that's, that's one simple thing is that it assigns the nodes according to the clusters, utilization, and power distribution, and other resources allocation, and assign a best node to the pod. So the pod will have the best node to run and spin up its containers. And if you look at the picture in the left, Sorry, the, 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 the clicker doesn't work. So, uh, so the part from the left, the top, <coughs> is the input that usually created by the user or created by uh, the deployment and the deployment manager, control manager spin up the path. So the path comes in and it enters the scheduling queue. And the scheduling queue will have some internal mechanisms to ensure the path gets sorted properly and fairly gets pops out. And the once the path pops out from the scheduling queue, it enters the scheduling cycle. So the scheduling cycle is the core logic of how scheduler schedules a path. So it basically uh, leverage another internal component called scheduling cache. So scheduling cache will listen to all the objects it's interested in, like the node objects, running paths of information and as, as, as well as others like storage, PV, PVCs, runtime class, uh, a lot of other information. So the core scheduling cycle leverages that kind of information so it has a up-to-date latest view of how the cluster looks like. So it can then, based on some predefined algorithm and uh, uh, policies like prefer prefer one node over the other. This kind of pre-config policies then will try to choose uh, best node for the pod to run on. So next, it will check whether the pod is scalable. If yes, it goes to another separate uh, implement implementation-wise. It's a separate go routine, so it goes to the binding cycle. Binding cycle does nothing but bind the node to the, to the path. So then the, the scheduling cycle ends with the path that carries the node name. Scheduler think is the best node for, for it. But it can be also, uh, the system is pretty uh, occupied, so there's even no single node can accommodate the, the path. So in that case, uh, the path gets put back to the scanning queue, and internally it will uh, go through some internal predefined back off timer, and then so that it can be fairly put back into the head of the scheduling queue and get retry. So basically, this is the very high level uh, structure of how scheduler works, and what's the input and the output of the scheduler. And uh, a little more detail. Uh, zooming into the into the green yeah green rectangle, so the scheduling cycle can be zoomed in into a very simplified two-phase 
scheduling process. One is called filter, one, the other is called score. So filter is that we popped out the part, the first phase is to look at into each node in the cluster, whether the node fits the part or not. For example, if you're asking a super large CPU, maybe some node fits, some node not. So in this case, we can see uh, node two, node three, and node four fits, but the other nodes doesn't fit. So in, in this case, we call these three nodes as uh, feasible candidates for the part to run on. Right. So after that, we will, based on some predefined policies, to see which node we should place the path to. In this case, we rank the three nodes and give a final score based on predefined scoring uh, policies. Then finally, like in this case, we give the node three with the highest score with 90. So the output of the screen cycle is that we come up with a no three for the part to bind on. So this is a pretty simplified phase, but if you want to know more details, we do provide some fine grain extension points that not only the internal scheduler is using, but the your customer scheduler can also use. Just basically we are using the same thing. Uh, no hidden APIs, Everything the internal cube scheduler uses is what you can use. So there's a, uh, another talk on Wednesday. There is a session, uh, a section that I gave is detailing the all the design patterns and uh, why we expose so many extension points and what is usage of extension points. So, so if you're interested. Uh, in the details of the scheduling framework and each extension point, you can check it out. Okay, next section is, is about the recent development in the last two or three releases. First one, simplified schedule config. So, we provide scheduling framework and we provide the, a bunch of extension points, but unfortunately, this is basically more developer oriented. Like you're implementing a plugin and you know exactly which extension points you want to uh, implement. But that can be troublesome for the end user or for the SRE because they just know, okay, I want to enable node affinity or power affinity plugin, but what's the idea of why I should know which specific extension point I need enable or disable, right? So in the before, if you want to enable one particular plugin, you should know which exact extension point it implements. In this case, like you have two plugins, full and bar, and then you have to know full actually implements four extension points, pre-filter, filter, pre-score, and the score. You have to specifically specify them and uh, yeah, for the same case for bar. But it should be something more user friendly, right? So that is why we introduced the so called multi point extension point. So this point is not a, a single purpose extension point, it's a more compound uh, extension point that in this case you just specify the plugin names under the, the multi point section. That in this case, you just tell scheduler that in the config, you want to enable full and bar. That's it. So internally, under the hood, it will check which exact extension points it implements. It's basically on some uh, reflection-based mechanisms to detect that and it will enable them under the hood. So that is so that you as an end user or SRE, you don't need to worry about which exact extension point it underneath in, implements. And uh, it's available in Kubernetes 123 uh, if you're using the latest of V1 beta 3 config and also in 123 if you're using the V1 config. And also, we didn't abandon the old style configuration. You can still use it, use the older scale style or use it along with the new style. So it's all tested, so you can give it a try. Uh, the second thing I want to introduce is the uh, 
it's a working progress feature called pod scheduler readiness. So if you look at the left picture is that once the pod is created, the pod will immediately enter the scheduling queue and waits for its turn to be, to be worked on, to be popped out. So there can be some cases, especially in some uh, customer solutions like associated with like a quota check or some other uh, in-house requirements that the part creation doesn't mean the part is ready for scheduling. So in this case, the part is scheduled anyway. Although we have back off timer inside, scheduling a part that is literally not ready is just waiting cycles. Especially if you're running a multi-tenant environment, scheduling the part that shouldn't be, uh, are not ready, it's just postpone the uh, schedule of other parts so that you will impact the overall throughput of the scheduling as well, impact the other parts that should be scheduled earlier so that will impact their end users, SEO, etc. So one thing we are trying to improve is that during the Scheduling queue and the scheduling cycle, which is unconditional. So right now we put a pink box. So we provide a knob in between so that uh, before it's popped out and it's been working on, user has the choice to choose whether or not the pod is literally ready for scheduling or not. So uh, the, the feature is being worked on is internally implemented by adding a power level fields called the scheduling gates. And then the, control, the regular workflow can be the user created the part, and the part should carry some predefined gates, and each gate is associated with the ex, external controller, and external controller should be responsible to uh, remove that gate when it thinks is ready for scheduling. So it can be defined, you can define um, more than one scheduling gate. And internally, there will be a default in queue plugin to check in the scheduling gates. And then when all the gates get removed, it will be eligible to be popped up. So that is the design. But it's still working progress. So uh, hopefully, it will be available in the next release, uh, Kubernetes 126. That's it. So next, a couple of uh, enhancements is about part to power spread. I will hand over to Ken Se. Yes, to talk about uh, it. it's a main domain in part to power spread. Uh, mm -hmm. It's now graduated to beta in 1.25, and it adds a new field, main domains, to to power spread constraint. And it defines the minimum number of to power domains. And the use case we have is like uh, you want to for spreading over minimum number of domains, and if there aren't enough domains already present, then make the cluster out scale provision them. So and uh, it can be only used with uh, do not schedule, uh, which is a hard constraint in topology spread. Uh, let's see the example. So let's say uh, we have a develop a deployment with two replicas and using uh, topology spread constraint with max q1 min domain two topology key host name do not schedule. And in this case, uh, one replica is now on the node, but another one is pending now. It's Actually, it's because of the mean domains we set. Uh, the number of domains uh, currently one, only one node, and uh, it should be two. So the cross out scaler notice the pending part and create another node so that this pending part can be scheduled. Yeah, there we go. So the next one, uh, take 10 iterations into consideration when calculating skill. 
So it's uh, now our for future, and we plan to graduate it to beta in next release. So it has a new uh, it adds new fields, node taint policy and node affinity policy to support the spread constraint, and those are uh, options to take to specify whether take taint and toleration or node affinity uh, into consideration when calculating the skew. Let's see the example. So let's say we have a deployment with for the spread constraint, um, max Q1, for the host name, do not schedule, which means hard constraint. And we have two nodes, and uh, node two has a taint. So of course, node two can't have uh, any parts uh, because it has a taint. Um, so the first one, uh, the first replica goes to node one. Then the pro problem here is uh, the second part uh, that uh, towards spread constraint wants to force, uh, wants to schedule next part to node two because uh, node one already has a part. Uh, but there is a taint on node two, so it will be pending. And this is the problem we want to solve with this uh, proposal, this new future. So we can solve this by specifying, uh, by setting node of, uh, sorry, node taint policy owner. By setting node node taint policy owner, uh, scheduler takes taints and torrential into consideration when calculating skews. So there we go. The next one, uh, to for this part, uh, to for this part again, uh, it's a uh, respect put to for this part after rolling upgrades. It's now alpha since uh, 1.25. So it adds a new field called uh, match level keys to for this part constraint. So the problem behind it was uh, the scheduler uh, uh, during rolling upgrades, scheduler doesn't uh, scheduler takes both uh, old replicas and new replicas into consideration when calculating the skew. So the problem here is. So yeah, we have a, let's say we have a deployment with for this spread constraint and let's go rolling upgrade. And uh, new replicas, uh, uh, so the scheduling of new replicas are affected by existing old replicas. So, After the ring upgrade, uh, it may be imbalanced to policy. So we introduce um, much rubber key, much rubber keys to to policy spread constraint uh, by by setting pot template hash to much rubber keys. Uh, scheduler takes only pots with the same same Pot template hash into consideration when calculating the skew. In other words, it scheduler takes only new replicas into consideration when calculating the skew. So we can solve the problem. Nice. Other not about nothing features and fixes. So performance improvement on demo set pods. So we updated the. Uh, pre pre filters interface uh, to return pre filter result. Pre filter result is a, a struct of Gorang. So, pre filter result contains the information about uh, which nodes uh, to evaluate in downstream extensions. 
So by using this in node affinity, uh, demo set pods uh, uh, scheduled in each node by using node affinity. So we, uh, by using uh, node, uh, no, pre-filter result in uh, node affinity pre-filter, we can improve uh, performance uh, on demo set pods. So next one is uh, memory leak on preemption. Uh, that was due to the unfrozen uh, context, and we refactored the scheduling loop to prevent such a, uh, such a memory leak uh, in the future. Next, uh, flash, uh, flash interval. So currently, the scheduler uh, moves uh, unschedulable pods to active queue every certain minutes. Uh, it was previously uh, five minutes, but uh, changed to, uh, no, sorry, uh, uh, so it was previously uh, 60, uh, 60 seconds, but uh, changed to five minutes. Uh, because uh, the reason behind it is uh, we want to eventually remove this flushing uh, in the future, and this is a fast step for that. The component config is stable now, and the latency, uh, no, legacy schedule policy config is removed, removed to 1.23, so if you still use it, uh, you should migrate to component config. Yes, that's it about the upstream update. From here, we are gonna talk about sub-project updates. First one, scheduler simulator. Uh, the schedule, uh, scheduler currently has the a lot of ways to expand or extend, uh, configure its like a uh, plugin or extend the component config, of course. And uh, the simulator helps you check or uh, evaluate the, your, scheduler, your scheduler's behavior. So it's a young project, so it has only simple feature right now. So uh, basically what this simulator does is so, um, it has own Kube API server in it, and uh, you can do anything. With, the, with that Kube API server. And so you can create resources, apply resources, delete resources, whatever. And uh, so then when you create pods in the simulator's API server, uh, the detailed scheduling result will be added to pods annotation, uh, such as a filtering result of each plugin or scoring result of each plugin. So usually we can see those information from the real clusters scheduler. So it should be helpful. And uh, yeah, so there are some interesting discussion going on. Simulator also has the web UI, so you can easily check the um, results from the UI, so um, filtering result, scoring result, and the normalized score like this. Next queue, uh, it's also a young project. Um, it's a job queuing controller designed to manage batch jobs as a single unit. So. It has these core features, uh, crawler, assign, uh, crawler management. Uh, it controls who can use what and up to what limit. And next, fair sharing of resources between tenants. So to maximize the uh, usage of resources, uh, any um, unused crawler assigned to inactive tenant 
should be allowed to uh, should be allowed to uh, shared fairly between active tenants and the uh, um, flexible placement of jobs across different resources types based on availability. So you can have the different various resources such as different architecture, GPU, CPU, or different um, provisioning modes like uh, spots or on demand. So other than that, we have uh, different queuing strategy. Uh, strict fast in, fast out, it's a uh, fast in, fast out. And uh, best effort fast in, fast out, it's uh, um, basically fast in, fast out. But uh, if all, all the workload uh, cannot be admitted, uh, it, it will not block uh, other young, younger, newer, workload that can be admitted. So Q has these APIs and any uh, other ongoing work is also interesting. So it's just a brief um, overview of Q. So if you're interested in it, in it uh, we have a official document, of course, and uh, uh, also we recently published a uh, blog post about Q, so you can refer that as well. Okay. So some more some projects. One is called Discaduler. Discaduler is, uh, uh, has been there for, for a long year, a couple of years. So basically the motivation is that uh, the scheduling decision was made based on the moment of the cluster's resource utilization. But as time goes, all the cluster states may change. So the optimal decision by the time in the past, maybe not that optimal anymore. So you may want to make the most of the cluster utilization. You may want to change by moving some parts to other nodes. So this schedule is this kind of project for you to define a couple of strategies and one some uh, criteria doesn't meet, then it will uh, kick in to evict the path, doesn't, doesn't, uh, violate, doesn't uh, follow the strategies you are defining. So basically it's running as a controller loop, and then you define a couple of strategies, and then you will check the path whether they fit the strategy or not. If not, it kicks in and evict that. So the, basically this is the idea of this schedule. And then as time goes, in the before, all the features are developed in this project, but as time goes, a lot of demanding requirements come in, and some of them are pretty, I think, uh, not that general, but it's still a requirement. So to fit the diverse uh, requirements, so the, the project is recently bringing up a proposal called the schedule framework, so that not necessarily every feature needs to be developer in this project. Instead, you can develop on your own repo and then just glue them together to come up with a, with a uh, scheduler, this scheduler, I would say, plus plus, and then yeah, to fit your in-house needs. So if you are interested, there is some new community meeting dedicated for this scheduler. You're welcome to join. Uh, this is for this schedule. And next is a new project called Quark. So when we talk about scheduling or testing the other scalability, we are using both control plane and the data plane. But for some specific area, like if you are just testing the functionality and the scalability of scheduler, actually you don't quite need the data plane because all the kinds of stuff are just API objects. I don't really want, need to spin up the real containers and backed by the nodes, right? In that case, you can save a lot of cost and then even just run the simulation or evaluation tool in your laptop. So that is why the Quark, Kubernetes without Kubernetes project comes in. So basically you can see it in the picture, it removes the needs of the Kubernetes. And then it will spin up a controller called Quark and Quark will watch the node 
and the pod objects. So it will make some magic to let the node and the pod behave they are backed by kubelet. Like it will maintain the hotbit from the node to the API server and also will make the pod transit from uh, pending if the pod carries the node name, right? Transit from the pending to the running state. So basically, it's transparent to you. It looks like you have the like 5,000 nodes in your laptop, but it's backed by the Coke. So the use case of Coke is that can do functionality in a very low cost and for some area like scheduling and also can do the scalability test for, for scheduling and also you can integrate easily to your pipeline without spin up the real runtime kubelet to spin up the containers. Yeah, that can be other usage, like if you want to test the uh, working progress across the auto scale implementation, you don't need to right jump into the AWS to buy the machines, try try it out, but you can just test test it you should cork bike the nodes. So that is the quark project. Okay, the last one is scheduler plugins. So basically both inch both the default scheduler and maybe your custom scheduler can follow the same pattern of use the scheduler framework to do customer, uh, to fit your customer requirement. So, but not every plugin can be in tree. So what, what should you do? So this repo is the place like marketplace uh, for you to contribute the idea, exercise some innovative thoughts and then work on specific area. Right now we have a lot of useful plugins like co-scheduling, elastic quarter, topology aware, scheduling, et cetera, and some very innovative and uh, some cutting edge maybe. Uh, network aware, load aware, scheduling. So if you're interested in as happens to have the similar requirements, you're, yeah, you're welcome to check out. All right, I think that's basically pretty much for today's session. And the next session is for Q&A. Questions? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Hi, thank you for the talk and for all the work mm -hmm. done on scheduler. Um, I have a question about Project Q. So, what was the motivation to do it if there is already a volcano which solves the same problem and part of CNCF? Uh, it's right now a Kubernetes SIG project. So, basically, it belongs to Kubernetes. Uh, I'm not sure it's the goal to go to CNCF as a standalone or just stay there for as a Kubernetes sub sub project, but that's, I don't think it does make a big, big difference. Uh, so my my question is less about CNCF, more about what was the motivation to create Q in the first place if, there, if this problem is already solved by other project in this case. Like, uh, is there any particular functionality that, or any particular problems that Q will be addressing that is not addressed yet? Uh, so, the Q project, although I'm not the maintainer, so it's trying to move some of the scheduling domain outside the schedule itself. So, it doesn't necessarily that everything needs to go to the scheduling core itself to be resolved. Instead, is standing at the controller's perspective, like some external requirement related with like quarter, like a sharing between multi-tenancies can be do outside. That is the motivation for, for Q. Mm -hmm. So just, I think it may be overlap with some CNCF project like Volcano and some others, but they do want to work into a slightly different Direction like a Q, as as this readme said, it will not cover the scheduling Q. But other projects like Volcano is just putting everything together, and you have just deploy all the things it provides and do that. So it's basically a couple, right? But the Q, you can just hook up with any other scheduling implementation, and then. Basically, loose couple. It's just focused on one particular of the domain it wants to resolve. Yeah, I think that's that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, are you able to customize the scheduler when you're using a managed version of Kubernetes, like EKS? Uh, so it depends on, I guess, on the 
public offering, Kubernetes offerings, you don't have the control of the control plane, right? So in that case, one thing I, I usually suggest is that you run the customer logic as a secondary scheduler, and you can use or disable the default scheduler that runs with the EKS control plane so that the scheduling flow works through your customer scheduler. So basically, if you use the scheduling framework based implementation, you have 100% compatibility with the entry plugins, power topology spread, power of energy, all the things you can use. One thing you may want to tweak is to point your workloads scheduling name to the customer scheduler you define outside. So maybe a little hassling, but yeah, I think that's the, the way because you have zero control to, to modify the control plane of the EKS. Gotcha, thank you. Any additional questions? Yeah, this one, yeah. Uh, sometimes you want to modify the pod spec after the scheduling decision has been made. Like, modify the schedule spec. Which spec do you uh, The pod spec. So after yeah, pod spec has a lot of fields. Which uh, let's say the container image. Container so, image. So let's. I say, think there. So basically, it's not quite a scheduling problem uh, question. So in the APIs definition, there are some fields can be mutated after the part gets created if you check the, mm -hmm. the, the website. I think image, image version, and some others can be mutated, but some others are just defined as immutable. So yeah, I'm not sure that is your So question. can we uh, like mutate it up in the scheduling framework itself? That's a good question. The suggestion is not. So basically, scheduler is not supposed to mutate some particular fields. It's just doing one simple job to find a node for it. So one, not field, one particular thing that scheduler does modify the, the part is only the condition, the status of the condition. Like if the part is not schedulable, then it will append uh, condition to that. That is all scheduler does. And another, well, not all. Another scenario is that it's in terms of preemption, it injects a status that nominate no name to that to suggest we, okay, are preempting some parts. So maybe in the later round, you can try that. It's a hint. Let's try that uh, nominating no name. So other than that, it's just the no name, because that is ending f stage of scheduling power. So in your custom scheduling, I think it's not that recommended to mutate the part of the spec. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's my suggestion. Any questions? Thank you, gentlemen. Yeah, and um, we'll still be here around if you want to have some right. offline talk. Thank yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.